It's been over five years now since the original Surface Pro was released, meaning that its viability as a used computer is going up thanks to falling prices. But is it worth the look all these years later, or is this signature product nothing more than a gimmick of its form factor? Let's find out in today's comprehensive product review. I'll pick this up and check this out. Easily, the Surface Pro's single biggest weakness would have to be the very thing that makes it unique, which is of course the form factor. If we look at a very crude illustration here showing the side of the Surface compared to a conventional laptop, there are a few noteworthy problems. These ultimately come down to the nature of the dual hinge design and the device's center of gravity. While a conventional laptop has one hinge that can be opened to almost any angle, the Surface Pro features two hinges one for the keyboard cover and one for the kickstand supporting the device itself. These two armatures have only one operational position, meaning that not only is the device stuck in this position for use, but also that it can't easily be picked up with one hand or used on much of anything that isn't flat without either falling over or wobbling around. If the Surface Pro is set up on a table, it takes two free hands to reliably pick it up and either move it or transition to single-handed mode, meaning that if I'm carrying goods or boxes or something with the other hand, I'd have to set those things down in order to accommodate for what's really a novelty form factor, if we're being honest. Perhaps the most obvious consequence of the singular operating position, however, is the way in which it restricts the angles and positions at which the device can be used. A single hinge laptop can be used on a table and from the sitting position, like the service, but can also be used on one's lap or from a standing position or from a table or chair of non-standard height. The problem with the Surface Pro is that it basically requires a table to be useful and just the right seating height to ensure that the screen is at the proper angle. This design is amended in later iterations of the Surface by adding more positions to the kickstand but still ultimately fails to solve the underlying problem. What the Surface Pro lacks in versatility, however, it makes up for in portability and performance. While most Ultrabooks have an 11, 12, or 13 inch display, the Surface Pro makes do with a 10 inch panel, which consists of a lead backlit Samsung LCD panel with a cool 1920 by 1080 resolution, offset by a recommended interface scaling level of 150% for the operating system, which is handled reasonably well by Windows 8.1, and even better by later builds of Windows 10. Scaling has never been a strong suit of Windows, especially when you throw multiple monitors into the mix, but it's at least tolerable on 8.1. As for the performance of the panel itself, it is fairly impressive, putting out a measured maximum of 371 nits of brightness and featuring a contrast ratio of 742 to 1. The default color accuracy isn't the best, but it's not terrible either. In fact, this panel is very impressive in its own right. The Panasonic display found on the Surface 3 does have a beat when it comes to resolution, screen size, brightness, contrast, and out-of-box calibration, but not by much. I've seen far worse panels on compact computers before, and while this one may not be the absolute best, it is pretty close. That small panel makes for a very small computer overall. Even the 10.8 inch Surface 3 makes it look small, and that's to say nothing of the 12 inch ThinkPad X200. And of course, the thing practically goes into orbit around the 17 inch Dell Precision M6400. At over half an inch thick, this would be a chunky device to call a tablet, but thankfully, the Surface Pro isn't what I'd call a tablet, and that's a good thing. What it comes down to, essentially, is that this thing is really just a very small and very powerful computer in a very unusually compact form factor. I mean, the performance to size ratio is truly off the charts here. I'm no brand apologist, but what I see here in looking at the reviewer opinions after having had some time with the machine hands-on is a system that's misunderstood more than anything. People see the underlying slate form factor and start drawing comparisons to iPads and Galaxy tabs and whatnot, and to a very limited extent, those comparisons can be valid. But the reality is that they cannot be allowed to carry much weight because they simply aren't the same class of device. 
I realized that the technology embodied in the Surface products brings us dangerously close to that point where the line between computer and mobile device starts to get a little bit fuzzy, but that's simply not where we are with this. The Surface Pro is 100% PC. And look, that doesn't mean that we can't criticize the consequences of the tablet PC form factor because there's plenty of subject matter there. Instead, I'm simply trying to make the point that comparing this PC to a mobile device of any kind is largely invalid. A PC is a terrible fit for somebody whose needs are better met by a mobile device, and a mobile device is a terrible fit for somebody whose needs are best met by a computer. I personally fall squarely into the latter category, since I already own a smartphone that adequately fits the job description for mobile device, making a conventional Android or iOS based tablet entirely redundant for me. When it comes to connectivity, there's not much to see here even for a 10 inch Ultrabook. You've basically got a headphone microphone combo jack and one lonely USB port. At least it's USB 3 though, so file transfers are extremely fast, even if the chipset is a bit on the finicky side. On the right hand side, it does have a mini display port output, which allows for both analog and digital output of video, as well as digital sound, which I'll cover later on. Finally, there's a micro SD card slot. The only other noteworthy point of connectivity is the power jack, which uses a proprietary magnetic plug. It looks kind of like Apple's MagSafe magnetic power connector, but is honestly kind of lame because it's actually quite difficult to line up perfectly. Once attached, however, it does work fine and recharges the device's LG Escalade battery reasonably quickly. There's even a soft white indicator light on the end of the cable to let you know that it's connected and providing power. Very fancy and very hipster. The power supply itself is fairly compact and has no problem running and charging the Pro at the same time. It even has an extra USB port of its own which allows you to do all kinds of neat stuff such as recharging a Surface 3, topping off a cell phone, or powering an external optical drive or other device that can't run from the Surface Pro's own USB port on their own. The only real drawback to this adapter is that both the supplied power cord and the one donated by Microsoft as part of the recall program are just pathetically short. However inconvenient the power cord might be, the machine does at least run off of 12 volts, so even though it can't be recharged in the car with one of those ubiquitous USB adapters like the Surface 3, dedicated power hookups are readily available at a reasonable price. At its heart, the Surface Pro is running off of an Intel chipset, complete with a Core i5-3317U Ultrabook processor and its on-chip HD4000 series GPU. It's equipped with 4GB of non-upgradable DDR3 memory from Micron and a 64, 128, or 256GB solid-state drive from either Micron or Lighton. All wireless functionality is provided by a Marvell Avastar 88W8797 chipset, which features Bluetooth and dual band 2x2 Wi Fi. The chip, which was originally designed for smartphones and tablets, actually also features an FM radio, but it is likely not implemented, and even if it could be enabled, wouldn't be usable due to the antenna not being hooked up. That doesn't stop this from being a surprisingly potent combination of components, though. In terms of performance, the Surface Pro could probably best be described as the little PC that could. Normally, it would be irrational to expect much power out of a little Ultrabook class machine like this, but Surface Pro has an uncanny way of surpassing expectations. Just when it seems like I've pushed the computer to its limits, it gives just a little bit more and throws in the towel long after one might expect it to. In truth, it ranks among the top when it comes to other computers equipped with the same chipset, which tells me that Microsoft at least took the time to get the internals and thermal design right, where some more poorly designed systems have to throttle back performance in order to keep temperatures in check. Even under maximum capacity, this machine is always able to maintain its base clock rate. The only exception to this is when it's running on battery power, at which time the Intel video system is limited to conserve power, at least according to the original analysis done by Notebook Check. The CPU, on the other hand, is never governed. Okay, I've got a lot to say about software, so we're just going to jump right in. 
Surface Pro originally shipped from Microsoft with Windows 8 and consequently supports it as well as Windows 8.1 and all of the Windows 10s that have been released so far. The community at large has also figured out how to run OS X and various Linux distributions unofficially. When I first got this computer, it was running a copy of Windows 10 build 15063, which worked well enough, but I had these weird intermittent issues with the Marvel Avastar wireless card randomly refusing to transmit data on the network. I could be using it just fine for tens of minutes, and then all of a sudden I wouldn't be able to load web pages or do anything at all. The funny thing was that while this was going on, the computer was still connected to the access point, but unable to actually speak on the network. Now, I wrestled with this issue for hours, not content with a PC that would only work most of the time, applying a whole barrage of suggestions brought up in discussion board threads discussing that very issue before finally resorting to reinstalling Windows. And you know what? It still didn't work. Frustrated, I tried installing other editions of Windows, including the latest and greatest Windows 10 build 16299 and the outgoing Windows 10 build 14393, but they all did the same stupid thing. Eventually, I decided to go back and try Windows 8.1, and even threatened it with rolling all the way back to Windows 8. Thankfully, this threat worked, and the Surface Pro came to its senses. Windows 8.1 installed without a hitch, and once fully established, never gave a single connectivity issue. I was seriously ready to call it a hardware defect, but apparently it's a Windows 10 thing. There are one or two other things that I would have liked to have tried, but the funny thing is that Windows 8.1 has actually really grown on me as I've worked with it here. While it does lack some of the handy night mode features found on newer editions of Windows 10 and some of the high density monitor improvements, these are things that really aren't deal breakers and what I've found is that Windows 8.1 actually lacks a lot of the rough edges that are still present on every single build of Windows 10 so far. The start menu is smoother and far more fluid. The control panel and Windows Update are no longer a spectacular pain in the ass to use. Certain Metro apps actually work better. And the visuals are just generally much friendlier to look at, as long as they're supplemented and tweaked a bit. Once properly configured and tamed, Windows 8.1 is actually far more tolerable than I originally gave it credit for. As mentioned earlier, the whole experience is powered by a pair of flat battery cells known as the LG Escalade. While they do store a good amount of charge, the Surface Pro's battery life is variable, with the potential to last for hours when the user doesn't exercise the machine too hard, and the good news is that most tasks don't really push the little i5 at all. In fact, when browsing the web, the only time I was ever able to get the machine running hot enough to switch on the cooling fans was when playing a high frame rate YouTube video in full screen. Even today's bloated and obese web is no match for this surprisingly agile chipset to handle without breaking a sweat. And one could easily achieve up to between three and a half to four and a half hours before depleting the Cadillac of all laptop batteries. Turn up the heat, however, and that chipset will drain the pack in less than 90 minutes under a full load. The last thing to consider about power is that the battery is not easily replaceable at all. So if you're going to buy this or any other computer with a battery pack that isn't meant to be replaced by the end user, you'll be glad that you ran this PowerShell command to generate a report of the battery's current health before buying. In my case, this battery is still very healthy, but your mileage may vary. At risk of this review running on for far too long, I'd like to quickly cover the topic of touch and input devices. The Surface line is well-renowned for its quality capacitive touchscreen, but it also packs a Wacom active digitizer into that glass, allowing it to be used with any Wacom stylus especially the one that is designed to magnetically stick into the power slot so that you don't lose it. Of course, when you want to get some real work done, there's basically no way around using one of the proprietary keyboard covers, both of which feature a keyboard and a small trackpad. There's also a slightly thicker one that has a built-in battery, which can extend the PC's runtime, but that's a topic for another day. I would be doing all of you a disservice if I didn't provide some fair coverage of the trackpad, however. 
because it's easily one of the biggest hindrances to productivity on the platform. For starters, it's simply too small, which is an easy explanation because that's what everyone says about small trackpads. This probably comes down to the overall shape of the computer, so there's not much that they could have done apart from not building the buttons right into the tracking service. This seems to be a frustrating trend that many OEMs have adopted, and I'm really not sure why. At any rate, it reduces the effective vertical tracking area to something like three quarters of an inch, which is kind of silly. Its small size is only half the story though, because it's been my experience that not all small track pads are bad, and that not all large track pads are good. To find out exactly why the experience seemed to be so lacking, I did a bit of research and read about a teardown that was done on the touch cover, which is very similar to the type cover with the exception of the keyboard design. It has the same basic shape though, and I'd have to assume that it uses the same trackpad hardware. At any rate, what they found was that instead of a normal device from Synaptics or even Elaine, Microsoft had fitted an Atmel branded touchscreen controller onto the thing. This partially explains how we can change at least a few basic settings and also achieve scrolling with just the standard HID device driver and no required companion software, but certainly does not allow me to forgive the terrible choice in hardware. I think the best way to describe it is that it seems to have a very low resolution, if you will, making it imprecise. If you turn the sensitivity up, it is fast enough to get around but the shortest and most precise movements that can be made simply aren't detailed enough. Now, the pad seems to be calibrated to accommodate for this, because when the mouse finally does move, it positions itself exactly as far as I'd expect given how far I moved my finger, but it took entirely too much movement to achieve that response, thereby overshooting my target, if that makes any sense. I'm a big stickler for good track pads, and I can tell you with complete honesty that this is not one of the best I've ever used. Coarse accuracy is good, but fine accuracy is poor. Statistically speaking, I calculated it to only be about 55 to 70 percent efficient as a good optical mouse or trackpad, and slightly worse even than a pointing stick. It is usable, but nothing I'd want to get stuck with exclusively for more than probably a few days, especially if I was doing any kind of serious work. It gets worse though thanks to its complete and utter ineptitude in the area of scrolling. This is the absolute worst scrolling trackpad that I've ever used or even heard of by far. For starters, even though it is unnecessarily wide, there are absolutely no provisions made for single finger scrolling, instead forcing the user to resort to using dual finger scrolling. This wouldn't normally be that big of an issue, but the real hang up is that the dual finger scrolling absolutely sucks. The accuracy and timing has to be absolutely perfect. That might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much. To say that it has a learning curve is being very charitable. And after having used it for several hours, I finally got the hang of scrolling down and now can get that to work about 90% of the time, but scrolling up is still a serious challenge for me. Now, I'll admit that I can be a slow learner at times, but even I would have expected more than just 60 to 70% accuracy in scrolling up by now. For what it's worth, Microsoft did learn its lesson and implement a radically different trackpad technology starting with the Surface 3 and Surface Pro 3, but that still leaves users of the first two models high and dry when it comes to having a decent tracking experience. Oh, and one more thing, there's no way to turn off the delay for which the trackpad is temporarily disabled after using the keyboard. This makes most types of gaming impossible, even if the trackpad was worth anyone's time. Aside from the dual hinge design, this is probably the Surface Pro's single biggest drawback. And the thing is, the problems are in the hardware rather than the software, as they are with most other bad trackpads, so it's not just a simple matter of tuning the settings to trim out all of the annoyances caused by the lousy default settings. The sound experience on the Surface Pro is a fairly decent one, being powered by the Realtek ALC3230 audio chipset. The fidelity isn't noticeably better or worse than that of any other laptop audio system, but the software implementation is actually a very rewarding experience. For starters, all the sound effects options are present, which isn't always the case with some sound drivers. This is enhanced by the fact that the output of the speakers and the headphone jack are controlled independently, so enhancements that are enabled for one don't have to apply to all. 
Beyond that, the computer even supports digital audio output through the mini display port connection. And this too is independently controlled in the software, making for a very versatile experience. The only real bummer is that the speakers are pointed out to the sides of the computer instead of toward the front as they are on the newer Surface devices. Side by side, I did notice the consequential lack of volume, but found that this could be dramatically reduced by placing my hands near the speakers to allow them to reflect the sound back toward me. From here, I was satisfied that the size and output power of the speakers was probably comparable to that of other small PCs, even if it is diminished by the direction in which the speakers face. Specifications and benchmarks are meaningless without results, so here's some real-world examples of what this thing is capable of. To give you an idea of its graphical prowess, here's a short montage of various games and emulators running on the Surface Pro. In the end, the Surface Pro is a lot like the CRT rear projection HD TVs of the early 2000s. Certain drawbacks made it a terrible buy brand new, but now that the price is getting to a point of becoming reasonable, I'm much more inclined to look past those shortcomings. You are still paying for the convenience factor with this thing, yes, but you also get something to show for it in the form of its expectation shattering performance. To put it into perspective, this computer can actually run certain demanding tasks with greater fidelity than my ThinkPad T61P ever could with its dedicated NVIDIA graphics. Granted, this machine is proportionately more expensive and virtually unrepairable and unupgradable, but I still got a lot for my money, the big prize being the 256GB SSD. Even the more common 64 and 128GB Surface Pros can still be worth it if you can find one cheap enough 
and can live with the limitations of the stiff form factor posed by the dual hinge design. We're finally at a point nearly five years after its release where this thing that was originally a novelty toy for the wealthy is now becoming affordable for the rest of us or cheap enough to make it a good secondary machine. Whichever camp you find yourself in, the Surface Pro stands as a testament to the value of patience and an example of what can happen when you buy formerly high-end hardware used. Don't kick my taxi.